everybody. Welcome to the West Virginia Botanic Garden. My name is Erin and I'll be leading the talk today on pollination. Before we get started, just a little bit of information about the Botanic Garden. Have any of you been here before? I have. Okay. So, okay, great. So you know a little bit about the area. Um, I'll just tell you a little bit about the organization. We're a nonprofit organization. Our site here is about 82 acres. So you may have walked some of it, you probably haven't walked all of it, but a lot of it is forested. We do have about five miles of walking trails. So we have the gravel trail you see here as well as some wooded trails back on the other side. If you're interested in walking some of our trails, we have a map and guide that will show you the trails as well as tell you a little bit about some of the gardens and the different trail areas. So you're welcome to take one of these from the kiosk here. Uh, some other information you might be interested in is our walk schedule. So if you do like coming on these educational type of walks and tours, we have a schedule here for the whole entire season. We have uh, four or five activities left this year. So if you'd like to take one of these before you go and come back and see us, that would be great. And if you're interested in becoming a member of the Botanic Garden or becoming a volunteer at the Botanic Garden, we have some information here for you. We do really appreciate all of our members and especially our volunteers because there's, we really can't um, carry out our mission without our volunteers. They're very, very important to us. So if you're interested in that, take some information and you can also ask me any questions you have as well. Um, and one, more, one last thing, uh, we have a newsletter. It comes out three times a year. This is our summer newsletter and it gives lots of information about current projects we have going on and uh, other activities, things that have been going on at the Botanic Garden. So, again, feel free to pick up one of these on your way out. Today's walk will last um, about 15 minutes. And we're just going to be going right down there to the Butterfly Garden. We'll spend most of the time there. Before we get going, if you guys need to grab anything from the car, it's a little hot today, so you might want to have a hat, water bottle, I see you have that already. Um, if you need to use the restroom before we start, we have uh, Porta John, it's right down that path on the left. So I will give you a few minutes to go ahead and do that. Alright, so here we are down at the Butterfly Garden, uh, up here at the West Virginia Botanic Garden. And today, like I said, we're going to be talking about pollination. And more specifically, we're going to be talking about the special relationship between flowers and pollinators and how that relationship is impor important to the survival of both the flowers and the pollinators. And it's also important to other animals, including humans. We'll get to that a little bit later. But first, I use that word pollination. Who can tell me what pollination is? I guess when it's like um, the bees carry the pollen to another flower. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then what does the flower do with it? I don't I don't know. Okay, <laughs> that's why you're here. Yeah. Good. Yeah, so what happens is, I have some pictures here to show you, but we also can look at some of the flowers. Um, the bee, or other pollinator, mm -hmm. what it does is it goes to the flower, and there's different parts of the flower. Most of us know what the petals are, the nice showy parts. But the other parts are the anther, which holds the pollen, and the stigma, which is this other part. So what the, what the bee does is it gets the pollen on its legs, or somewhere on its body, it goes to another flower and drops it off on this other part. Then it goes down a little tube to the bottom of the flower, and that's where the flower actually makes its seed. So, why does the flower need the bee? To reproduce. To reproduce, exactly, yes. Yeah. So, if the bee wasn't there, the flower would have no way to get its pollen from one flower to another flower to reproduce and make a seed, and then make new flowers. So it's really important that the flowers have the pollinators. Why is it important to the pollinators to have the flowers? What do they get? Um, they use the pollen to, like, don't they use it for honey? Bees do. Yeah, bees use nectar for yeah, honey. Bees. Okay. So, and then also, pollen actually is nutritious too. So a lot of the pollinators eat the actual pollen, but not all of it. So they eat some of it, and then some of it gets stuck on their bodies, and then that's when they transfer it to the other flowers. So it's important for the pollinators because they get food from the flowers, and they need food in order to survive. The flowers need the pollinators in order to reproduce and make new flowers. So they need each other for survival. Let's take a little closer look at 
this in action. So here's some examples of some pollinators at work. So we have a beetle, and we have a bee, and we have some flowers here. And you can actually see the pollen on the beetle and on the bee. You can see some pollen on the, on the edge of the, that flower there on the petals. So if you take a real close look at a bee, you probably don't want to get ever, ever that close to a bee, but in this picture you can see that it has all these little hairs on its legs and on its body. And the beetle also has all these little hairs on its head. So that's where the pollen gets stuck. It just kind of kind of hitchhikes on there. This is sort of like Velcro. It's really sticky. And so the pollen just sticks right on there. And then it gathers up in this little spot on the bee called a pollen sack. So a bunch of pollen gathers right there. And you can see here, here's the bee um, getting some nectar out of that flower. And so when it, it gets stuck there and then he goes to a new flower, drops it off, and then that pollen is down the tube, eventually making a seed. Wow. So this relationship between pollinators and flowers has been going on for a really long time. And through time, um, the flowers have changed along with the pollinators. And the flowers have actually come up with different ways to attract pollinators. And they've also developed different ways, they've uh, kind of made it more specific to which pollinators they want to come. So let's look at some of the flowers we have here and talk about the differences. First kind I want to talk about, let's see, we'll talk about these here. These are generalist. Okay, so this one, that one there, sort of the traditional shape of a flower where it's open, has petals around the outside, and then in the middle is where you see um, where the pollen is and where the stigma is that the pollen gets dropped off. So these flowers, they're inviting any old pollinators to come. They don't care who. That could be a butterfly. What are other what are other kind of pollinators? Bees, butterflies, bees. beetles, beetles. Um, yeah. animals. Sometimes. Yeah, sometimes animals do. Yeah, mm -hmm. bats are pollinators. What else? Um, what about what flies around at night? Um, other than bats. Like Va butterflies. Vampires? Vampires. <laughs> they're like butterflies. Moth. Moths. Moths, yep. yep. So they're pollinators also. Um, ants sometimes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So lots of different organisms that come to these flowers. And these flowers here, um, they're, they're pretty much open to whoever wants to come and land on them. These flowers here also. Mm -hmm. um, and But they also are, they have a special technique going on here. So this flower here, show, point to one of those flowers. Um, I, I don't want to get close. <laughs> oh, there's a bee right there. Yeah, that's why. Yes, yeah, so that's a flower, right? So right now, we're not really supposed to pick these flowers. Otherwise, I'd pick it and show you. You can, you can kind of get down and look. Mm -hmm. But I'm going to show you on this picture of a sunflower. The amazing thing about this flower here, this is a zinnia, and sunflowers, is that actually this is many, many flowers together. Each one of those petals is actually a flower. Yeah, so this is just the showy part, and at the very bottom of that petal, I'm going to pick just a little bit so maybe you can see. But in general, we don't want people to pick our flowers. I see. Thank you. I think the bees know her. Bees know her, yeah. You do need to be careful, though. Okay. So if you had a magnifying lens, do you see that right there, that little squirrely thing? Uh -huh. That is the pistil of that flower, which is that red part that I showed you before. That's where the pollen gets dropped off, okay? And then eventually, it's going to turn into a seed. You can already see the seed developing oh, wow. at the bottom there, okay? It's like the sunflower seeds that you can eat. Exactly, yeah. And then in the middle of the flowers, these are called ray flowers, and in the middle, See all these little things popping out? Uh -huh. Those are also individual flowers. And inside of that, so this is a close-up of a sunflower. Mm -hmm. Here's the sunflower. Here's the close-up of the middle. See all these little flowers uh -huh. inside? So inside of there, there's the pollen and the pistils also. Mm -hmm. So lots of little tiny flowers inside of there. Mm -hmm. But if you're a pollinator and you're all the way over there and you're looking for some pollen, 
Is it going to be easier for the, you to see one of these little tiny things just standing here or this whole thing? The whole thing? Yeah. So what they do is these flowers group together into one big thing and then the pollinator sees that from far away and it flies over and it starts walking around on that whole thing and it actually gets lots of pollen on itself and then when it goes to another flower it can drop off lots of pollen and all of these flowers can get pollinated at once. Other flowers do that as well. You can see here on this phlox how there's the individual flowers you can see, like you know, regular pink flowers, but they're bunched in those clumps. So from, far, so from far away, the pollinators will come and then they'll find each individual flower and look at the nectar out. Another way that helps the pollinators come, especially bees. Scientists have figured out that bees actually can see ultraviolet light that we can't see. It's just a different range of light. So there's all these different colors of light and we can see within a certain range. So we can see like red, orange, yellow, green. Past that, past like purple is what we call ultraviolet. It's another color that we can't see, but bees can see it. And some of the things, some of the colors that we identify as a color, they see as different colors. So in this picture, you see two different yellow flowers. This is what the bee is seeing. White and red. Yeah. Yeah. And then this one looks purple with blue stripes to us, but the bee sees a white flower, the red stripes, and a red middle. So why would the flower have this kind of coloration? What does it look like? You want to try and get right in the middle. Yes, yeah, so these flowers, they have their pollen and their crystals right in the middle. So that's where they want the bees and the other pollinators to go. They don't want the, the pollinators to waste a whole bunch of time on the outside because they're not going to do anything. And the pollinators want to go straight to the middle because that's where their fruit is. So the flower makes it easier and they give them this bullseye target and then they go straight in the middle. On this one, they even give them little uh, guidelines, exactly. Yeah, it's like a runway. If they're coming in, they're going to make a landing. It's a runway straight into the middle, and they can land right there in the middle. And a lot of flowers are also oriented in such a way it makes it easy for a pollinator to land. So these flowers are flat. The bee can stand right on there, walk around, not have to spend a whole bunch of energy. And you'll see other flowers, a lot of flowers that are shaped like that. Uh, some flowers uh, have a whole bunch of little flowers bunched together that make kind of a flat landing, kind of like these up here. Lots of little flowers bunched together, but it's a nice little flat landing spot. And we can actually see, there goes some butterflies. There goes one right there. <laughs> and uh, some bees up there. So this, these, all these plants are really good at attracting pollinators. So could bees, like, see the flower is red? Could the bees see that red? Mm -hmm. Or would it still be the same? Yeah, they could see red, but really bees prefer, the colors that we see, the bees like, are yellow, blue, and purple. But what they see is this red and white. So depending on how you're defining the colors, um, what we see, so they would really like these yellow flowers. Now an ultraviolet to a bee, they might be seeing white and red. But if you're going to ask someone what color does a bee like, you want to say yellow, because that's the color we know that it is, <laughs> right? <laughs> So, um, so a lot of times, the yellow flowers you'll see bees around. Now, some of the other flower colors are, are trying to affect different kinds of pollinators, like butterflies. Like butterflies? Yeah. And what colors? So usually like reds and purples and pinks, mm -hmm. and also the shape of a flower. So these are what we call the generous. It, it attracts any, any old kind of pollinator. Now, some other flowers we can come look at. Let's come look at these ones. These have a more complex shape to them. They're kind of really fancy, and the, uh, the, the anthers and the pistil are kind of in down inside of there. So, some of the bees could try to get in there, but this is really trying to attract like, butterflies or maybe even hummingbirds. Okay. 
pollinators? Yeah. They are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so anytime you see a flower that has sort of a tube shape, I think there's another one over here like that. Those are trying to attract usually butterflies and hummingbirds. Mm -hmm. Now butterflies and hummingbirds have a, a special kind of tongue that they can stick down in there and get the nectar out. The flowers that make a lot of nectar takes a lot of energy to make nectar. So they don't want any old pollinators coming and taking all their nectar. So what they do is they make their flower a certain shape in that tube, and their nectar is at the bottom. So the only pollinators that can get their nectar out are the ones that have that special tongue that can get down in there. And that rewards them for getting in there and getting the, and getting the nectar out. But as they're doing it, they get that pollen on their head, and they can go and pollinate. Flowers. They're like sunflowers, and so they, again, the middle part is all a bunch of little tiny flowers, and then the petals on the outside are all the flowers. And so those are more intended for bees or general pollinators. So anyone can land on there and, and get the pollen from them. A butterfly could also. Butterflies do too. So butterflies can can pretty much go anywhere they want. <laughs> So yeah, they're, they'll, they'll take any kind of pollinator. And one reason they do that is because they make lots of flowers and lots of pollen, and so they don't have to spend a whole lot of energy in making nectar. So they're fine with a whole bunch of pollinators coming to them and moving their pollen around. Don't flowers give us oxygen? Plants do. Yeah, the leaves. That's right. Yeah, so that's one benefit uh, that flowers give us. And we'll talk about some more of those benefits. Why is there a Japanese beetle? What do you think? to get their uh, nectar and their pollen. And so as they do that, you know, they all have a little bit of fuzz on them. So they're all going to collect pollen and move it onto the flower. What are the sweat bees' purpose? Sweat bees' purpose. Yeah. Purpose in life? Uh-huh, yeah. <laughs> they're pretty much like any other bee. Uh -huh. You know, they, they want, they're not going to sting you, but that's just the defense mechanism. They're mm -hmm. still going to go and get their food and, and uh, you know, feed their, feed their young. And just like the purpose of any other bee out there. So this one, you guys saw a butterfly. Uh, a butterfly landing on here. This is a red flower. It's called a cardinal flower because it's the color of the cardinal. And it's got that tube shape, so the butterfly can stick a special tongue down in there and get the nectar right out. It's really hard for any other insect to get in. There. You can see it's a little, really tiny tube if you look in there. It's very hard for any other insect to get in there unless it's really small. But the butterfly can get right in there, and that's what this flower wants. It wants the flower. It wants the butterfly to come and move the pollen, take the nectar, move the pollen around, and then you can see it's already making these ones are the flower is gone. But that's because the flower has done its job. It's attracted the pollinator. It's been pollinated, and now these are the seeds developing. Mm -hmm down in the bottom. So remember mm -hmm. I said the pollen went down the tube to the, to the bottom of the flower? Mm -hmm. And that's where it makes it seed. So you can see down here, this is where the seed is developed. Mm -hmm. Is that where it's kind of like bulky right there? That's right. Yep. Mm -hmm. You can see the ones at the bottom here are even bigger because mm -hmm. they're further along. Those seeds are getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Mm -hmm. Like, how would, like, people get the seeds out from, like, the, like, the zinnias without, like, breaking the plant? Or, like, how would they get those seeds? Usually they do break the plant. Yeah, mm -hmm. so if someone's harvesting like sunflower seeds, so the middle of that sunflower we're looking at, all of this, mm -hmm. all of these turn into sunflower seeds. Mm -hmm. So if you look at a sunflower that's already been pollinated and the seeds have developed, 
this whole middle part is just a whole bunch of sunflower seeds. Uh, would you be able to take them out yourself and, like, when they've been developed long mm -hmm. enough, would they fall out? They do fall out. Yes. Yeah. Oops. Thanks. You're welcome. Yeah, so once they're developed far enough, they do just fall out. But usually that doesn't happen because the birds come and get them first. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, birds really like the seed, the sunflower seeds. And so that was one of the benefits I was mentioning before that other animals get from flowers is that when these flowers make seeds, lots of other animals will come and eat those seeds. So if a person wants to harvest the sunflower seeds, usually they take the sunflower out of the field a little bit before the seeds are completely ripened, uh, so the be so the birds won't take them. Because as soon as they're fully ripened, the birds are going to come take them. <laughs> so if they want them, they need to make sure they protect that flower from the birds if they want to keep all the sunflower seeds. There's another flower over here I want to show you. It's really neat. Are these wild flowers, the little white ones? Yes, this is yarrow. This is one I was going to mention before about being a generalist. And it creates a little landing pad here. So you see lots of small flowers, but one big bunch where the bee can come and land and walk around easily. And uh, so it benefits the bee and the flower at the same time. Do normal, like normally for smaller flowers, do smaller bees go after them or all sizes? All sizes, yeah. So any of those generalist flowers will attract all size bees. Um, but the small ones can land on there. The bigger ones actually might not go for that one because if a big like bumblebee lands on that, it might just topple right over because it's a little too heavy. <laughs> But that brings us to this flower. This is called a turtle head. You see why it's called a turtle head? Yeah. yeah. So this one actually is made for big bees, like bumblebees. Because what it does is the bee comes and it lands right here. And the bee is happy enough that it opens that little door. See that? And inside of there, you see the yellow part? Uh -huh. That's where the pollen is. And way down in there is where the nectar is. Yeah, it doesn't look like a mouth. Yeah, so this this flower has VIP access. <laughs> Very important pollinators only can go in here. So the bee has to be the perfect weight. That bee, that bee is probably big enough to get in there. Would butterfly try and get that? Butterfly could try to get in there, but butterflies are really light, so it probably wouldn't be heavy enough to push that door open. Would their tongue be long enough? To their tongue would be long enough to get in there. So if they could find out a way to push that down, or if somehow it broke off, you know, from a heavy bee or something, they could get in there and get that nectar. But these flowers are really specific. They really want the big bumblebees to come and sit on that trapdoor and go in there. And the reason they have the pollen right here in the front is because they want the bees to go past that pollen, down in there, get the nectar, and then they're guaranteed that that bee is going to get. Oh yeah, there it is. Awesome. Cool. Oh, it's going to be yeah. It's so cute. <laughs> it's sometimes bees will hang out in there for a while, <laughs> sleep in there if it's raining. <laughs> yeah. Wait, so the rain wouldn't like push down on the bee from the petals they were in there? No, I mean if it was really super heavy rain it might. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Could so that's what's raining. Wait, how the flowers go up and down. Mm -hmm. And like those flowers, they have just kind of it kind of does on the top. Yeah, yeah. kind of. Mm -hmm. But on the side, uh -huh. could only a butterfly land in there or could a bee land in there? Uh, bees can kind of hang on. If you watch a bee for a while, you'll notice that sometimes they will sort of land on a flower upside down and hang on. That one's trying to do. See? It's doing oh, it right now. Cool. Yeah. So they can get in there. But yeah, you're right. A butterfly could easily hover there and get in. Uh, butterflies prefer to be able to stand on top because it's Less energy. There it is. Oh, yeah. There's one of those. Um, oh. Is that one of those? The, 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 that one is called. It, it looks like a cheetah. Like a cheetah. Oh, yes. That is a great thing of fritillary butterfly. And that bush that it's on is called the butterfly bush. My neighbor has those. Yeah. So, um, one, way, one thing you can do if you want to attract butterflies or pollinators to your yard is you can plant a garden like this, which is a butterfly garden, and it'll attract pollinators, and it's important that we have pollinators around, not just for the pollinators and for the flowers, but who else benefits from these pollinators doing their job? Uh, us. Yeah, so how do we benefit? Um, 
get the air from the roof. Mm -hmm. Yep, what else? When they replant new plants, it gives off more oxygen, and don't we benefit them by giving off carbon dioxide? We do, yeah. All plants, um, trees, any kind of plants, benefit from our carbon dioxide, and we benefit from their oxygen. But another thing about the pollination process is what happens <laughs> What happens when this sunflower is done? What does it make? It makes sunflower seeds. The bird eats them, and we eat them, right? So they make food. How about, what's another kind of food you might eat? Apples? Where do apples come from? Trees, oranges. Oranges. So let's think about it. An apple tree starts with a little pink blossom flower. A bee comes, gets some pollen, goes to another flower, puts that pollen onto that flower, and then that pollen goes all the way down inside to the bottom of the flower. Now eventually that flower doesn't really make a seed, but it makes fruit around the seed. That's the apple. Oh, is that why there's seeds inside the apple? That's why there's seeds inside of the apple. So if you took the seeds out of the apple, they would make more trees that would make flowers. Yeah. So we get the fruit because the pollinator came and pollinated that flower. So aren't bees pollinators too? Because if they drop the seeds there, they can grow anywhere? Yes. So there's also animals that spread seeds around that help the new trees to grow. Aren't there those plants where it's like kind of pokey and sticky mm -hmm. and it sticks? Mm -hmm. What is that called? Well, there's lots of different plants that have that, but yeah, so that's a different way for seed dispersal to happen. So once a plant makes a seed, there's lots of different things that can happen with that seed. For one, it can make a fruit around it, and that's what we eat or other animals eat. And so it benefits us and the animals, but it also benefits the tree because when you're done with the apple or when the animal's done with the apple, puts it on the ground, the seeds eventually go down into the ground and it grows into a new tree. That's one way that the seeds are spread to other areas. And then another way, like we talked about, is some seeds are really sticky, and they stick on animals, and then those seeds get dropped off somewhere else, and they go into the trees. Is it the same way with, like, grapes, since they're on vines? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so grapes have seeds inside. So same thing. Yeah, so any, any uh, plant that makes either a seed that we eat or a nut that we eat, you know, some trees, hickories, um, lots of other trees make nuts. Um, oak trees make acorns. Okay, those are all the result of a pollinator pollinating a flower and then a seed or nuts or fruit being made at the end. And so the animals eat them, we eat them. What are some other products that we eat that come from? What are, what are bees? Um, honey. Honey, yeah. So that's another way that we benefit also from pollination. The bees go to the flower to get the nectar, and then they bring that back to the hive, and there's a whole process they go through to turn it into honey, and they benefit from the honey, they feed that to their babies, to their eggs, but people also benefit from that because we eat the honey as well. There's also uh, lots of different beverages that we drink that are made from the, either the fruits from the flowers or the nectar of the flowers, um, and one thing you might not think about is the clothing that you're wearing from fibers that grow. Cotton. Cotton, yeah, is a plant. And lots of different grains. So cotton comes from a plant and gets pollinated and turns into a seed. And then we make cotton out of it. And lots of the grains that we eat come from fields that are grain that are pollinated. Isn't sassafras like food for like drinks and stuff? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sassafras, yep. We got a soda and a tea out of it, I believe. That's one local here that you could, you could benefit from. Mm -hmm. Yep, wheat. Yep, wheat is pollinated. Yep. Okay. Wheat is the seed that we get at the end of the pollination process. So all of these things have. You don't really think about like, grasses and some other plants having flowers, but they do. They all have little teeny, teeny, tiny flowers that are pollinated from little teeny, tiny insects, and then they turn into little seeds that we eat, that we eat or do different things with. So very important process um, for both the pollinators, the flowers, and for all the other organisms that benefit from the process of pollination. Now one thing to think about is that uh, sometimes pollination is threatened from different
different things. Like pollination couldn't happen if we got rid of all the farms, right? Or if we got rid of all the insects. So sometimes um, if we clear a whole field of flowers to, to make a store, to make something, that's getting rid of a whole bunch of flowers that could be pollinated and turned, and turned into fruit or grain or, or benefit some of the animals that are around. Like those birds. Birds love, the birds are going to be super excited about this right here. These are all turning into seeds right now and the birds are going to come eat those. And be nice and so all the animals that depend on it, those flowers would no longer have food. Um, also, sometimes when you're, people are growing gardens, they don't like to have certain insects on their garden, so they put insect, insecticide on there, which kills the insects. But it also kills the bees and the butterflies. So then, you sell food. down the birch. Cool. Uh, like, is it better to like, if you plant like flowers and trees in your yard? Is that better? Like, do you get more oxygen and stuff? Is it better? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're, yeah. If you plant trees and flowers in your yard, you're going to get oxygen, and you're also attract pollinators that are pretty to look at, and you're also helping all of these animals that rely on these flowers for survival. So we, you know, we benefit from from these things from getting fruits and nuts and things. But the wild animals that live out here, they need these flowers in order to live. So one thing that we can do is to plant these kind of gardens in our homes and give the butterflies and the bees and all the local animals some food to eat. If you're interested in doing that, this is a publication by the West Virginia um, Division of Natural Resources about butterfly gardening. It tells you all about it. And it even gives you a list of plants that butterflies like to come to that are local to this area. And so you can go home and you can plant one of these gardens at home and attract local bees and butterflies to your yard. Another thing you can do is protect areas like this where we have lots of gardens that we create for the pollinators. So why are these flowers like if they're dying? Since they're petals, why are they Yeah, well they are dying. So what happens is the flower, the only purpose of the flower really is to attract the pollinators, get pollen, and make a seed so then they can make new flowers. So flowers don't really have a song, so like that's not like that. No, they have a pretty, usually most flowers go through one season and then they drop, they drop their seeds and they grow back again. Now some flowers will grow back from the roots from before, so it's kind of like the same flower. Uh, and then some flowers will only grow back from the seeds that they produce. Um, do you, like, isn't there certain seeds that milkweed are in that butterfly? That's right, yeah. So milkweed is an example of a relationship that's important to the monarch butterfly. We saw one of those before. Like it was up here. It was orange, it had orange and it had black stripes. Mm -hmm. So the monarch butterfly will lay its eggs only on milkweed. Mm -hmm. And then those eggs will turn into caterpillars. And then those caterpillars will eventually turn into adult monarch butterflies. And the monarch butterfly adults can, can get nectar from lots of different flowers, but they need the milkweed plant in order to lay their eggs and make caterpillars. So it's very important to have milkweed plants. So if you want to protect and help more monarch butterflies grow, then you could plant milkweed. What kind of butterflies that one? Like one? Yeah, so that one I think is a spice bush swallowtail. There's two kinds of swallowtails around here. Spice bush and well, yeah, there's lots of different, yeah, there's a few different um, swallowtails. There's two black ones, though, that look like that. The spice bush swallowtail and the pipe one. I think earlier I just saw a yellow swallowtail. Mm -hmm. And that one has, like, kind of a yellow arch on it, like, and it's black. What is that? The, like that one? The, the yellow one with the black stripes is the bee stripe. And the yellow one with the black stripes is the eastern tiger swallowtail. And the the yellow one with the black stripes is the eastern tiger swallowtail. And which one are you looking at? The there. The little one? Yeah. That one is a skipper. Called a silver spotted skipper. It's kind of brown and a little, little silver spot underneath. And you can see this uh, butterfly bush, it's kind of a combination of those two different kinds of flowers that I talked about. Mm -hmm. It's sort of a generalist. <laughs> yeah, that's the fritillary. The, the butterfly bush clumps flowers together, like we talked about, in order to attract mm -hmm. pollinators, but it also has a little tube inside that is. That attracts the, the butterflies and it's purple. It's good for butterflies. So, and the mosquitoes are 
<laughs> yeah, mosquitoes aren't really good pollinators. Mosquitoes are pretty much pointless. <laughs> mosquitoes get their food from us, so they don't need to go to flowers. Yeah. yeah. They have a point. Some some of the other animals eat them. So yeah, that's, good. that's what they're good for. Mm -hmm. But um, so so I'm pretty much finished up here. You guys are welcome to stick around and ask questions. But I hope you learned something about pollination today and the relationship between um, the flowers and the pollinators, how it's important for their survival, and how pollination is also important to us to protect that process. Thanks so much for coming. You're welcome to stick around and ask questions if you like. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> you can still really ask me questions.